with this, I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, please go ahead, perhaps just unmute yourself and, and uh, ask. Yeah, I think Ulrich is uh, raising his hand. I need to... Yeah, I think you're on. I can't hear anything. Hello? Yes, oh, yeah. I can hear yeah. you now. Sorry, my, my headphone had a bit of a hiccup. Uh, so Martin, it was a great talk. Thank you very much. It was super interesting. And uh, I, I, I hope you're not going to be angry with me if I steal your 2D views of 3D scenes slides because <laughs> that, that was super cool. It's a point I'm trying to make all the time. <laughs> I, I, I stole it from um, Izzy Jaya Singer in... Uh... I think she's in Leeds. So I stole it anyway. So you, you ah, perfect, it. perfect, Sarah. In a true retro scientific spirit of cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, my 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 question now is actually about data archiving. So I'm I'm, I'm wondering mm -hmm. about the um about your policies when when it comes to like uh, archiving raw data somewhere, uh, because when you when you uh, somehow reduce your your volumetric data to meshes or whatever you would, depending on who funds you or whatever, uh, still need to archive your raw data. So how 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 are you handling this? So is this still archived or are you just discarding it and say, okay, we're good enough with the meshes or? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that the volume EM community is wrestling with a lot at the moment. So obviously the amount of data that's being produced day in day out is too much to put on any sort of public repository but there there are things like uh, so the embl has the ebi in the uk up in cambridgeshire and they have a bunch of um uh repositories image repositories that they uh invite people to um any data that's associated with publication. So not just any old data that you require, mm -hmm. um, but any anything that's associated with publications or um, or benchmark data that's you know of significance. So perhaps I can quickly share. Um, oops. No, that's not working. Uh, I'll quickly share. So so we use this um, repository called. Uh, Empire. So it's um, it's part of uh, EBI, which is part of the EMBL, and they have mm -hmm. uh, a whole bunch of data. It, it kind of started largely for these kind of cryo EM or structural biology type data sets, but now they've opened it up so we can put our uh, volumetric EM data up there. And I think cool. they have data sets. You see, like uh, you know, these cryo EM guys are putting many terabytes of data up per um their position and they uh you know they they get funding for it so they obviously can always do with more funding but they're they're developing a whole set of tools for uh depositing data and also in fact um they're working in this big project for next generation file formats so you know if i put a terabyte of data up there and you want to use it then you just have to download it and that's problematic. Whereas if you use a next generation file format like mm -hmm. R or N5 or the HDF5 type files, then you can almost stream the data at the resolution yep. that suits you. And um, that's still work in progress, but I'm very excited that that's the, the way things are, are going. Now, this, is, this is super cool. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to browse the archive definitely. Great. We've got one more thank question you. from, from uh, Michaela. Yes, thank you. So um, I have more or less a follow-up question to Ulick's question, because um, how do you deal with the um, charging, for example? So all this data which you segment, they are always gone through segmentation, uh, through registration of the samples. So if you have, for example, charging in your EM exhibition, you will have for, to register two, two slices, you will have to distort one of them. So if you now want to measure something, um, what is really the truth of the real data? How do you deal with that? Yeah, so charging, charging artifacts 
so where the electrons stick to the resin and they warp the act like a lens and they warp the um the image that you, that you're acquiring so so different approaches yeah one is if it's very very bad then it might be that you just skip that slice and um typically there's a range of solutions so one for, for the serial block face system that i showed um at the quick we're very lucky we can work with a lot of hardware partners the best way to deal with any of these problems is at point of acquisition and there's something called a focal charge compensator that we have installed on this um so it's you know it's it's more money going to uh the, the manufacturers but but actually it completely kills the charging on the serial block face imaging if you do get it um yeah it's it's a problem that the, the community is working on so there's people working on things like conductive uh, resins and so on to try and channel um electrons away that i would say is still largely in development uh, if it's a small amount of warping you can in principle retrieve it via uh, a non-linear warped registration so we we've been looking at um if you use fiji at all there's this um plugin called big warp which um is very good at sort of um correcting smoothly varying artifacts um but yeah it it, it is a problem to, when it distorts the image in 3d it's a problem because your 3d unit no longer picks up that you know the, the membrane in this slice is the same membrane as in the next slice because it's moved with respect to yes the and if you want to measure distances then if you so which one will be the correct one will it be the distorted one or the yeah. you know how can you check that this is the distorted one and this is the raw one so I, I i agree that this is something that should be considered i think there are probably a bunch of other challenges that need to be solved before that's the limiting factor in your measurements so for example something that a lot of people don't think about if you're doing transmission em and you're cutting slices on an ultra microtone those slices are not flat right they're curved with the arc so how important is that you know that that might be curved on the the, the degree of the thickness of the slice so actually a straight object will never look straight so but it's it, it it's sort of It, it's not the it's not the limiting factor in people doing the analysis so i agree there's a lot of kind of micro considerations in doing these sort of quantitative measurements that um that people aren't really thinking about at the moment because it's just it's not it's not presented itself as the the most significant problem but they, they, it will become the most significant problem somewhere down the line Okay, thanks very much, uh, Miguel, for the question. Uh, are there any other questions in the audience? If not, I have probably a million myself, to be honest. So one one of the questions, for example, that I would be very, very curious about, since you have performed uh, this enormous effort with the Citizen Science Initiative, um, I'm wondering what is the next step? Would you be able, for example, to uh, employ something called active learning in order to help them use the model sort of to guide a little bit the annotation and let people correct it rather than draw it from scratch? And uh, if that's your consideration, what, what where are you going with this? And uh, another question, again, to the same project would be, um, how good is the uh, i mean I, you, I think you shared a little bit on the consensus and especially on on those french cases where people start you know writing some funny things uh but on a more subtle way what is the best deal in your opinion and i think you would have the biggest sample number to to and be most qualified to answer this question therefore uh, what well, what's the best deal to deal with a consensus in a, in a large annotation corpus like this um so with your first question so the active learning so definitely so we, it's it's of a lot of interest to us it's because we're working with the Zooniverse platform, it's non-trivial for us to implement anything directly into Etrasil, but the Zooniverse team are integrating 
active learning into some of the, I think, astronomy projects. So possibly, I can't remember which one, it might be Planet Hunters or something like this, where the, um, to optimize the influence of the annotations, you want to present the images that would be most useful to have be annotated rather than just randomly at the moment, you know, just get served a random image. And if it's uh, one, one of the things we've been interested in is you know we show it show each image to 15 people if it's a very easy image probably the first three people completely agree and you know we could save the next 12 people the hassle and have them do something else so yeah ha having um sort of active control over the distribution the serving of images is definitely something that the zooniverse is building into its platform and hopefully will come trickle down to etch we're, we're, we're right at the tail end of their tools so we they're, they're forever developing new add-ons and tools for us because it's not something that they've needed before um but yeah I, I think this is the way forward because the data sets the data acquisitions are just getting faster and faster and even this method you know and we have thousands of people who've annotated it's still drop in the ocean of the the amount of data we acquire so yeah so now the 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 neural network architectures are considered a somewhat solved problem right that you can get you know you can get good results if you put a unit in it you know there's there's probably better ways but you'll get good results if, if you do that um so i think people now are moving on to things like optimizing your training or doing you know the different training models like active learning and human in the loop and and so on so yes um i'd say watch this space but um it's not something we have means to actively develop and then the, the second one for for the aggregation um the, the sort of building consensus it sort of depends a bit on um what you need to do so the the nuclear envelope i showed um we want the membranes to be as accurate as possible because tiny defects in the curvatures of the membrane and so on are the things you're looking for and so um you know it, it's a you'd get a very very high dice score for example but you could be you know pathologic case if you're you, you could have a dice score of 0.9999 and your prediction doesn't intersect with the ground truth at all because you're one pixel away or something like this right so it's um that there are things that choosing the right metric is important so for that we use this house dwarf distance rather than um the, the area overlap types uh, for others we we can get away with the area overlap so the um mitochondria and, and for those then the the aggregation methods for mitochondria is probably somewhat easier than for others because it's sort of more naturally or at least the scientific questions that we think to ask with those at the moment, the the kind of area type metrics and area aggregations are kind of easier. Um, there's a lot of, we, we went through a lot of different ways and that there are all sorts of things you can think of in terms of applying, for example, non-pixel based methods to um, aggregating. So, you know, vectorizing and, and uh, uh, contours and, and such um but again it's uh even though i you know i freely admit we have access to a lot more resource at the crick than uh, a lot of institutes it's still finite and there, there are lots of things that, that we'd like to do but the, the plan is that we're going to release our kind of toolkit for aggregation as a python package a pypy package or something like this so it will be out there hopefully fairly soon Oh wow! Excellent. That's that's very exciting, actually. Uh, yes, please, please do uh, shout uh, on on Twitter. Martin is, by the way, a very very active Twitter citizen. Uh, anything, if you want to know anything happening in the world of microscopy and deep learning at the same time, do subscribe. Uh, as I'm seeing this advertising here. <laughs> um, all right. So with this, unfortunately, uh, I see that we are. Uh, on top of the hour and and we're, we're running out of time unless there is a very very burning question is is there one very well okay with this i would like to thank martin again and uh 
thanks very much for for joining today and thanks uh, for for uh, being present with us to all the audience it was a great pleasure thanks very much